to somebody cause your name we Yahweh your name we is Yahweh yes I am hey, hey, hey. your name is Yahweh hey, your name we is Yahweh hey, your name to exalt him from the deepest part of your spirit open up your mouth if you want to lift up your hands to Jesus you can do it if you want to announce and say that indeed he has been good to you open up your mouth from deep in within and begin to give him a praise and a worship that he deserves shamenema zeke lampes kebeto Robokondo salabahande ginahaya rimpaya kande bekeleba rababos sekete ina masopra de akosada sheke balihandre bayaka rempeke sete ke baliki iribibo shata labahate lebo shia kanda labaya kana mahasi we love you jesus listen to me. I want us to read something in the book of John chapter number 2. John chapter number 2. We can begin from verse number 6 so that I don't waste time. I'm sure we know of the story. I want to show you a reason to lift up your voice today. Now, scripture says, now there were a set of six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews. The Bible says, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Continue. It says, 
in verse number seven, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Continue, verse number eight. And he said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast tested the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew that the master of the feast uh, of the feast called the bridegroom. Now, we have this story preached to us, so allow me, I just want to take a small portion of it. There were six jars that were filled so that there could be a drawing later. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. So, these six jars were what we call earthen vessels. And for long they were used for them for what they called the mikveh. We call that the place of ritual worship. And they used to wash themselves before they would do particular things. And I tell you the truth, even some of us, the troughs and the buckets we have at home that we used to wash our feet, we most often misuse them. Praise the name of the Lord. But now, a vessel that didn't really look that important at this particular time finds itself in a place where Jesus needs to perform a miracle. Do you hear me? And for the first time, what was used for washing needed to be used for drinking. I don't know if you hear me now. It was earthen vessel for washing, but by reason of it being full of water, there was a drawing, and the vessels felt some sort of importance. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us in verse number 7 that there is such treasure in earthen vessels. What that means, what that means is that the vessels are earthen. They can be looked down upon. But there is a God who needed to store a treasure. And of all vessels he could think of, he gave it to a vessel that is earthen. When we go through things in life, we appear as these new, weak, and useful vessels. When you don't even have things that you would need to have to go forward, we appear as this thing that can't amount to anything. But in Cana of Galilee, some earthen vessels received a few moments of faith. And by reason of them being full of the water, which scripture tells us that your word is water. You may have stepped into the gathering of champions as a vessel that did not look like it had a use. But today, by reason of ministration of the word, we are asking that there let there be such fullness in these vessels. Because there could be nothing to draw from unless there was something that was put in it. Now, I want you to see something. It came in as the word it left out as wine praise the name of the lord i came to tell you for truth and for sure this may be earthen vessels but god didn't look for any other vessel he wanted this earthen vessel by reason of filling it with the word so that you can be drawn and the earth and the world can begin to drink from you you came here as a vessel may there be a feeling because the world is thirsty I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but don't let the weakness and the issues that are going on around you. I know you may be having anger problems, but there is a feeling today because the vessel is not important by itself. 
the vessel is as, it, is, 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 is as important as what it carries. And I came to ask somebody today, what do you have on the inside of you? That is what God wants to look at. And I pray, by reason of coming to this service, may there be a feeling that will lead to a transformation that will make you better than what you are when you stepped in. Somebody open up your mouth and say, Lord, I know, I know, I know they called me Athen. I know I look weak. I know I don't look the part. I may not be as qualified. I know they don't look at me as it. I may be poor. I'm going through stuff. Things are happening left, right, and center. But there is something that I need. Something needs to come. Something needs to give. I pray by the ministration today. May there be a feeling by the word of God that will transform what was mere water to wine by the throwing. May men begin to say, Oh, Shalabayandri, what was Athen is now useful in this dimension. Can I hear you pray? Somebody cannot even give a worship because of what you feel in your body, because of how you feel you are. I came to say today, there is such a treasure. There is such a treasure. Open up your mouth, for I thank God for the Holy Ghost, because by reason of such deposits, vessels are turning. Oh, Sarabayande Bayaka, Ah, Rebando Sadebe, Rete Kosa Katariba, Rabakoso Beleke, and Telebra in Akoria, Mande Kosira Kateleba. Come on, you have a few more seconds. Open up your mouth and begin to announce it. I carry something in me. 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 Short, but I have an old destiny. I may be weak, but I have a strong calling. I may be a nobody, but by virtue of what I carry, I am a somebody today. I say I'm a somebody today. I say I'm a somebody today. I say I'm a somebody today. I get to tell people, you can go beyond your trouble, your struggle, and your problem. Oh, Sarabaya Garaba. If you believe what I'm saying, somebody, put your hands together right about now and begin to celebrate Jesus. He trusted this vessel. He trusted this vessel. Come on, give him a mighty praise and a shout. He looks at you as something someone that can carry something and may the world begin to draw from you may your family begin to draw from you may your neighbors begin to draw from you may the office begin to draw from you let there be a transformation may what will be deposited begin to transform you so that in the future men can draw from you men can draw from you in jesus mighty name in jesus mighty name in jesus mighty name Somebody give him a shout! Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Now please smile at your neighbor. Nobody has smiled at him for a very long time. Amen. Tell them you look beautiful in church. Hallelujah. Tell them you look beautiful in church. <laughs> ah, tell them you look even more beautiful under the anointing. Ah, praise the name of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, Nipo, go to Yanga Wasis. You know, Hallelujah. Receive greetings from our pastor, who is in Mombasa preaching in JCC. Praise the name of the Lord. Them that have been following online, fire is in that house. Hallelujah. Can we just celebrate the man of God as you receive his greetings? Amen. Uh, so I think when we'll be giving our, our offerings, is when we'll get the announcement. Right now, I feel we need to go straight to the word. Amen. So our pastor didn't leave us alone. Today we have our another father. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, that is Pastor Mark from Life Church International. So kindly put your hands together and celebrate the man of God. Wow, let's put our hands together for the Lord Jesus and give him praise. I said, let's give the Lord Jesus praise. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can give your neighbor one more time a high five. Tell them this is a day the Lord has made. 
We will rejoice and we will do what? Be glad in it. Glory to God. Let's appreciate this wonderful team for laboring. God bless you so much. You are a great blessing. So take your seat in the presence of God. As you heard, my name is uh, Mark Mutinda. I'm a son in the apostolic house. Uh, ministering and laboring alongside our spiritual father, Apostle David, and also your pastor, uh, your man of God, Mr. T, and it's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, of course, I'm married to Gladys Wangari. We are blessed with two boys. Uh, one of my sons, the firstborn, is a teenager. You know how years move fast. You know, I can't believe this year in December is going to be doing his KCSE. You know, it's amazing. Our first one is called Simeon. The other one is Daniel. And by the grace of God, this year we celebrate 20 years of marriage. Wow. Amen. Uh, I honor and appreciate Apostle T for his great work and uh, what he's doing in this place and also all over this nation. Uh, may the Lord renew him, refresh him, and strengthen him. Together with that, I want to appreciate the whole leadership team of Truth Mentorship for your great work. Can we appreciate these pastors, these men and women of God for the great work that they are doing? Let's go to John chapter 3. I have a very, very, very short time. And uh, if this turns out to be a Kesha, please don't blame me. Glory to God. Or what do you think of a mini Kesha? <laughs> you know, so John chapter 3, I want to read from verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. You hear that? We can even add and say is flesh indeed. <laughs> and that which is born of the spirit is spirit indeed. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Father, we pray that as we share your word in this brief time, may you inspire us, give us utterance. And Lord, we pray that you give us a spirit of understanding. Father, we ask as we leave this service tonight, we will not leave the same way we came. May there be a transformation. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Before I begin to share the word, I want to uh, invite you at this time, all of you that are here in this house, you can go to Facebook. Uh, so I allow you to go to social media. So Turn on your phone, go to Facebook, and look for Elevate TV. 
kindly uh, do that. We will truly appreciate even those of you that are watching, wherever you are, if you're watching by social media, on Facebook, please uh, just help us. When you go on Facebook, you look for Elevate TV and you're going to see the gathering of, of champions. It is live right now. And what I want you to do, I want you to put it on your Facebook page and send the link to your friends. Invite some people to join in and we will truly, truly be grateful. Now, the conversation that is going on here is about the kingdom. And Nicodemus and Jesus, they are discussing, but Jesus' focus is on the kingdom. The message of the kingdom is a very important message for us to understand. I will actually put it to you that unless you understand the kingdom of God, you can never really comprehend this whole thing we call salvation or the church. It is all about a kingdom. Miles Monroe labored on this before he, he passed on and he said the Bible is a message of a king and his kingdom. It's all about kingdom. I know uh, to a certain extent this kingdom message has been overstretched just like many other messages and truths in the Bible where we try to separate between an, a normal gospel and another gospel of the kingdom. But my conviction and persuasion is everything about the Bible, everything that we say and refer to as a gospel is about the kingdom. And that being the case, I want to share with you on a topic that I call kingdom realities. There are certain realities about the kingdom of God that every believer must know and experience. The kingdom is real. It is not theory. As much as we cannot see it, it exists and it operates and it has power. And the Bible says by the end of the day, the kingdom of God will rule all things. So the Bible records this man by the name of Nicodemus. Somebody say Nicodemus. Ask your neighbor, is that your name? Nicodemus. So let's, let's uh, make his name short. Let's call him Nico. Glory to God. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And the Bible says that this man comes to Jesus at night. And the Bible actually states that Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was a teacher of the law. He knew the law of Moses like the back of his hands. He could even recite it. I believe he, could, he actually had memorized the whole Torah, the whole first five books of the Bible. So he was not an amateur. He was someone that was educated in the words of God. Then he comes to Jesus by night. Of course, your guess is as good as mine because he didn't want anybody to know that he was talking to Jesus. Amen. Jesus was a young man compared to him. But then Nicodemus comes and mentions something that is very telling, pastors. He tells Jesus, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now, he does not say, I know. He says, we know. So this man was speaking on behalf of others. He was not there by his own behalf or on his own behalf. He was there on behalf of others. So there was a group of people that Nicodemus was talking with and relating with and they knew that Jesus was a true teacher. Praise God. And for your information, Nicodemus is a very interesting man because the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't even mention him. But Apostle John is so interested with this man that he mentions him at the beginning of the Gospel where we have read John chapter 3. 
And then if you go to the end of the Gospel of John, Nicodemus comes up again and the Bible says him and Joseph of Arimathea, they went and asked for the body of Jesus. So this was a well-known person among the disciples. We know that you are a teacher come from God. But I want you to notice what made them know that Jesus was a teacher come from God. He did not say because you teach well. <laughs> no, no, no. Because anybody can teach well. If you go to school, you'll be taught the laws of teaching. You can teach well. Praise God. Tell your neighbor you are a teacher by potential. So the fact that someone can teach well and they can design a message and deliver a sermon, does, that does not qualify them that they have come from God. Because Nicodemus said, because nobody can do the things you do. So teachers who have come from God are approved not by what they teach, but what they do. What they do. I pray that God is going to raise teachers who do. My God. Who do. Not just teach. Not just explain. But they are proved by God through signs and wonders. I believe we are in those days that God is going to approve his teachers and those that he sends with signs and miracles. We are still going somewhere. May this watch stop until we finish this message. Glory to God. Because we cannot divide it into two. <laughs> Next Thursday, some of you will not come. So you need the whole package. Glory to God. Now, think with me. If you are a teacher, Ken, you're a minister, and then someone comes to you and say, uh, man of God, I know you are a man of God. Because the things you do are so powerful. What will you respond? Or how will you respond? If it is a normal person like me, I will say first and foremost, thank you. Sinizuri kusifiwa. Yeah, it's good to receive some praise. But Jesus is a very interesting man. He is different. Even when he is approved and congratulated and affirmed by Nicodemus, Jesus to him, that is a non-issue. So Nicodemus is here sitting with him. He says, I know that you are a teacher. We know you are a teacher come from God. Nobody can do these signs that you do unless God has sent them. And probably Nicodemus wanted to add and say, for example, uh, tell me, what is your secret? Can you show me? Because I'm also a teacher. I want to be like you. But before Nicodemus continues with that conversation, Jesus intercepts the conversation. And tells Nicodemus, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, where is that coming from? <laughs> you see, Nicodemus is caught off guard. He, was, he didn't see it coming. He thought it's going to be a normal conversation where he speaks and then Jesus responds. But Jesus does not respond. Jesus begins a conversation at another level. Because he wanted to elevate Nicodemus to that level. So he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I want to suggest to you tonight that that is the first reality of the kingdom you must experience. Oh God. The first reality of the kingdom and all of these realities are birthing processes. So you must be born. Now, the English Bible says unless you are born again. And I want to tell you, that is wrong. It's not about being born again. Jesus in that scripture did not tell him you must be born again. Ah, my God. Now, why did they, they use the word born again in English, translating it from Greek? 
It is because of the next question Nicodemus asked. He said, how can one go back to his mother's womb and be born when he is old? You see, Nicodemus was not getting it. So the word here is not being born again. Jesus literally told him, unless you are born from above. My God, this new birth is not being born again. It is being born from above. Unless you are born from above. Because you are already born on the earth. But the kingdom of God demands that you be born from above. Because later on, John the Baptist says, he that is from above is above all. So when you are born from above, you become above all. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and dominions. Now why is it that Jesus said you must be born again? Because let me tell you my friends, because I know this is a very simple message, especially this first point, but it's important for you to take note of this. Let me tell you. The new birth experience it is something that heavens determine. My God. There is no way, man of God, you can choose to be saved. The reason why you chose salvation, according to the book of Romans, is because you were chosen. Let me ask you, how comes... Among all your friends, so far, you're the only one who is saved. Do you think you are better than your friends? Ah, some of us were bad news. You are born again, or you are born from above, because heaven determined your new birth. And that is something we must understand. And it is important when it comes to soul winning, because if we don't labor in prayer and intercession, so that something can be transacted from the heavenly places. Many people may not be converted. Oh glory to God. Tell your neighbor you must be born from above. You must be born from above. So that is a new birth experience. It is the first experience in the kingdom of God. Now notice this. Because I'm not going to stay here for a long time. Notice this. The Bible says, and Jesus is speaking, he says, unless someone is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom. So the new birth experience is that, <laughs> that code that is opened by God so that you can see the kingdom. How many of you remember before you got saved, you used to look at Christians and begin to, and, be, and we used to think these people are crazy. Do you remember, for some of you, those who entered the church before you got saved, my friend, you will enter and you will see people lifting hands and then you will be wondering, why are they lifting hands? And then you will see a grown up crying. I will say these people are crazy. Why? Because the kingdom of God was strange to you. Because you cannot see it. You cannot touch it. It is strange. But now when you get saved, because now you are born from above, from the heavens, now you come to a place of seeing. What, what does that mean? You begin to be aware there is a kingdom. Oh my God. You begin to be aware. Something is different. There is a kingdom. We cannot see it. We cannot touch it. But we feel it. Glory to God. How many of you have ever seen God with your physical eyes? Have you? But how many of you know he is there? How do you know? How many of you were alive 2,000 years ago and you saw Jesus? Hey, unless you're Melchizedek. You have no beginning of days <laughs> or end of days. 
But how many of you believe Jesus is alive? Now, if someone convinces you and challenges you and says, prove to me that you are saved and Jesus is Lord and he's alive. You can quote all the scriptures you want, but they may argue with you. But there is something in you that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know that God is real. Now that is what we call faith. It is a deposit of God that is released in your spirit. You cannot explain it, but it is alive. Oh my God. It is alive. You know that God is real. You know that you are saved. You know there is a heaven. You know there is a hell. Oh God. And you don't need a preacher to know because there is a seed of God. Unless one is born from above, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So for you to see that kingdom, there must be a new birth experience. And we want to open this door even as early as now. If you are in this service or you are watching and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is your day. None of you is here by accident. There's nobody who is tuning into this service by accident. And I believe that this is your day. Tell your neighbor, this is your day. Glory to God. Now, let me tell you. There is a problem that we have, servants of God. And uh, this one I must speak a bit slowly because it's sensitive. We are living in a day where in the church you cannot tell who is saved and who is not. Oh God. Do you know there are people who are so accustomed to church Eh? Because from the day they were born, some of them, they knew church life. So if it is singing, they can sing. Oh God. Some of them are faithful tithers. So if you talk about giving, they will even outdo the genuine believers. And I want to put it to you, there are others who have a testimony. Alien Amwana Akona Ushuda. Now, Yo Andiko, that scripture does not mean he who has the son speaks things. It simply means if you have the son, there is a witness within you that is there. He, he, you have the son. Yeah. It's not what you say, it is what you know in your spirit. Because you can speak. But it is not a reality in your heart. So we are living in very sensitive times. And nowadays, even us as ministers, we are walking carefully among the people. Because it's not, what you see is not real, my friend. What you see is not real. Higher. Oh, glory to God. You people, you are blessed. Every one of you is blessed. Hallelujah. <laughs> We, we, it's not easy to tell nowadays. And by the way, it is the same experience that happened to the children of Israel when they were leaving Egypt. Now the Bible says, and, and I don't even have time to go to that because we are already out of time. The Bible says when the children left Egypt, the word that is used about the people that left Egypt, he says, it was a mixed multitude. Now, you read the Bible, you hear the children of Israel were delivered. But in their deliverance, almost all the slaves that were in Egypt left with them. There were Moabites who left Egypt. There were a few Amalekites who left Egypt. My God. Probably there are people from, our <laughs> from Africa in those days that left Egypt with Israel. It was a mixed multitude. But God was not concerned. He says, let them go. Because he knew he would take the mixed multitude, all the people from the 12 tribes of Israel, and the other people who left with them, he would take them to a place called Mount Sinai. And the Bible says he picked them up on eagle's wings and brought them to himself. Now, notice... Before he brought them to their promised land, he brought them. 
to himself. So before you enter into your land of inheritance, you must be brought to God. So he brought them to himself to Mount Sinai and then he began to speak to them. The Ten Commandments that you remember, God tells them, prepare yourself. And the day when it came, they were ready with new clothes. They had washed. They were around the mountain. God began to speak. Everybody scampered for safety. Because they were afraid. And they came to Moses and said, please, don't allow your God to speak to us. You go speak to him. And whatever he tells you, come and tell us. Now, that experience in Mount Sinai is what converted that mixed multitude into one nation. So now what do we do with the church in our time that is a mixed multitude? What do we do? I want to tell you this. The only thing to cure that problem introduce the word. The word is what distinguishes people. Anybody who does not have the seed of God in their heart, when the word begins to be, to be spoken and declared, they get uncomfortable. So the word is what distinguishes people. Either they are converted by the word or they are removed. Okay, this is for pastors, but it's also important for you. The word is what distinguishes. Yeah. I've gone to meetings and I'm not speaking against anybody or any kind of event. I've gone to meetings. When the time for singing, my friend, everybody's jumping up and down. Oh, glory to God. Eh? Especially if it is a hot song. Eh? Talking about themselves. Not about God, about themselves. And by the way, have you noticed, man of God, many of our songs nowadays is about ourselves. Yeah. It's about ourselves. Kujitumbuiza in the presence of God. No problem with that. But you see, that is not enough. It's not enough. But when you tell people, sit down, open your heart to receive the word, those that are not born from above, they begin to move. Uh, they, they can't be comfortable. Either the word of God confronts them and change them, or the word of God separates them. And removes them. I pray if there is anybody in this service and you have not yet been born from above, may this be the word that is going to convert you. Glory to God. So that's the first reality of the kingdom. There is much we can say there, but we don't have time. Now look at the conversation, how it goes. The Bible continues to say, Nicodemus say to him, now he's confused. He's caught off guard. Now he says, how can someone be born again when he's old? I mean, Jesus, can't you look at me? How can you say I, I must go back to my mother's womb? Because the Nicodemus cannot fit in the womb of the mother. But it is, he is too small for heaven. Hey. The womb of heaven is too huge. It can fit everybody in the world. So Jesus explained to me, how can I go back? Then Jesus continues with the conversation. Now I want you to notice, because when you read the Bible, you need to take care of every word. Jesus does not respond to him. Because what is the first question? He says, unless you are born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus wants Jesus to explain. Jesus does not have time. Thank God after 2,000 years we are explaining what Jesus said. For Nicodemus, he was clueless. But then Jesus does not respond to his question. He takes the conversation to another level. He says, verse 5, most assuredly, and Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born, you see again, bathing. There are so many bad things in the kingdom. Unless one is born. Now here he does not say you must be born from above. 
He says, unless now you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter. What was, what was the first thing in verse 3? You cannot see. So the new birth causes you to see the kingdom. But the second kingdom reality, and I'm going to dwell on this for a while. The second kingdom reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that you must be born of water and the spirit so that you can see. Now enter the kingdom. Now let me give you an example. How many of you, before you came to the apostolic house, these truth mentorship meetings, you used to pass along Kenya cinema? How many of you? And some of you, you knew, because your friends told me, Mr. T and Akwanga Pale. So you pass through Kenya cinema and said, Mr. T is normally there. There is a meeting that goes on there. Now what was happening? That was the seeing. But what happened to you the day you said, today, this Thursday, I'm going to enter. You said, ah, kume na kuanga hivi. So, now listen to this. There are many believers that are genuinely born again, born from above, but they have only seen the kingdom. They are aware that there is a kingdom. But they have not explored the fullness of this kingdom. You know that is scary. You can be in a kingdom that yes you have seen. You are aware of it. Now it does not mean you are not saved. But you have not entered. In other words you have not explored that kingdom. You don't know the facets of that kingdom. And let me tell you, if we begin there to begin to explain the kingdom, we will take two months. I'm not lying to you. To describe what is this kingdom so that you can explore it for it to make sense and for it to begin to work in your life. Why is it that there are many believers that don't have a confidence in God? Salvation is a religion. It is a, a, a life of duty. We, are, we get saved to be good people. There are many people who are like that. So it is religion. But I'm here to declare to you, the kingdom is a reality. You must be born by water and spirit to do what? To enter. Now let me give you an example. Can I have two individuals who are willing to be an illustration? I want to have Moses. Now, someone will represent Moses here. Glory to God. Say hello, Mr. Moses. So who is Moses here? <laughs> Musa. <laughs> this is Moses. And this is, this is Caleb. This is your junior. And uh, I am Joshua. Now, why am I using these three examples? And I'm not going to give you scripture reference. Go study the Bible. These three are the major characters that left Egypt in the deliverance. Three. Moses was the leader. And of course, Moses had Aaron and who? Let's put those wazes aside for now. But here is Moses, the deliverer. Oh my God. Here is Caleb, a young man from the tribe of Judah. This one is from the tribe of Levi. And then here is Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim. Now, the major person I want to concentrate with today is Joshua. Joshua. <laughs> okay? Now, why Joshua? How many of you know that your savior is called Joshua? Jesus is not the name the angel said. It is like asking Amkamba 
to pronounce your name. You know what I read? Sindio? Vile tuliaribu majina mingi. There are so many names in Kenya that have been damaged because of what we call mother tongue. Now, the angel when he appeared to, to Mary, he told Mary, your son will be called Yeshua. That's where we get the English word Joshua. But now for us, we know he is called Jesus. Because he will save people from their sin. In other words, he is appearing just like Joshua appeared. Oh my God. So Joshua is in Egypt with all these two people. Oh God. Now what is Egypt? Egypt is a world before you got saved. Joshua was there. Now, they all left Egypt and entered into the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. Now, let's come to, to, <laughs> to Moses. And please take note of this. Joshua is with them. All right? Tell, tell, tell your neighbor, Joshua is with them. So, it's not that one has Joshua and the other one not. So, all of them are saved from Egypt. But now Moses is raised to be the deliverer. But Moses had a problem. And the problem with Moses was anger problems. Now if you have anger problems, be careful. No, no, this is not the main message. But let me touch on this. Because I may be speaking to somebody here today. Moses, when he was 40 years, he sees an Egyptian beating a Jew. The anger in him wells up. He hold, take holds of that man and kills him. That man was strong. Man of God. A man that can kill another man and bury him is a strong man. Now, when he kills the Egyptian, the Pharaoh hears the news, but now Moses is forced to flee from Egypt and he goes into the wilderness for 40 years. Do you know, and this is my humble submission, the reason why they stayed for 430 years was not the fault of the children of Israel. Because God cannot use someone who has anger issues. So now, his, his school was extended for 30 years. To learn patience. And what did God do? He took him to Midian, Midian to take care of sheep. In other words, God was telling him, I want you to be looking at sheep for 40 years so that you can know how you need to behave. So every day, lesson is one. Wake up, look at sheep. They don't have any anger issues. They are patient. They are peaceful. The following morning, wake up, look at it. And the Bible says after 40 years, Moses was the most humble man in the earth. Now, <laughs> looking at what? Sheep. <laughs> Mr. Moses, you are blessed. <laughs> but notice, the anger problem did not end. So now he delivers. Joshua is still with them. They come to the wilderness. God takes Moses up the mountain. And when he goes up the mountain, God carves the tablets from the stone. God. God. Yani mungu anakav kwa rock mawe. Anetengeneza vizuri and then his finger writes on it. Gives to Moses and says go back. Tell them how they need to live. Moses take the tablets. Comes down. Finds the children of Israel worshipping an idol. The anger in him rises up. And I want you to notice that transaction to receive the tablets took 40 days and 40 nights. No food. But now the anger begins to well up again. And he takes the tablets that God has made and written with his finger and bah, drops them to the ground. Destroyed the thing that God made. Anger is bad. 
Moses, God looks at him and says, Moses, Moses, Moses. Now, this anger will destroy you. But because I love you, the last time I forgave you, this time I will forgive you, but there will be consequences. Yeah. Go up for another 40 days. So don't be so happy when you fast for a week and then God tells you go back again. You need to ask yourself, why is he telling you to go back again? Kunakitu. There is something. So he goes back, but God tells the consequence is this. You yourself, you will carve the rock with your own hands. Then bring to me the, the rocks that you have carved and I'm going to write on them. So Moses is forgiven, goes back again. Joshua is still there. Caleb, just a quiet man there. Oh God. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter. We are coming there. God comes to Moses, says now, because the children of Israel are complaining. We don't have water. We don't have water. Give us water. And then God tells Moses, take your staff. Go to the rock. Speak to the rock. And water will come out. So Moses takes his rod. Joshua is with him. <laughs> Goes to the rock. And because he's angry, he tries to speak. Words cannot come out. How many of you know when you're angry, you try to speak, you find one word is overturning another word. Now Moses is so angry, cannot speak. He takes the staff and he hits the rock. And then he tells him, how long will I tolerate with you, you wicked people? Now God says enough is enough. Moses, because you have not honored me before the people, now you will not enter. But Joshua is there. Moses, you will not enter. Why? Because this time around, God was not angry with the nation. But Moses was angry. Don't ever think that your anger is the anger of God. I'm telling you. There are times you are angry and God is not angry. That time God was not angry with them. They were murmuring. He was not upset. He told Moses, you give them water. Speak to the rock. And the rock was Christ. But he hits the rock. And God says, you shall not enter. Now Moses is confused. He organizes a prayer meeting. He comes to God and says, God, I plead with you. Forgive me. I have led these people all these years. Allow me to enter. And know what God tells him? Go to the top of the mountain. You will see. But you will not enter. May you not die in the wilderness. <sighs> the assignment of Moses was cut short. That's why he did not die. The same way the assignment of Elijah was cut short. That's why he did not die. When Jesus was in the mountain of transfiguration, they were told, now go back, finish your assignment. Peter, James, and John, can we build a booth? They had come to finish. <laughs> so Moses, you shall see the kingdom but you shall not enter. But notice, Joshua is with them. So that means they are saved from Egypt. The same way you are saved from the world. Jesus is with you. He is your Lord and your Savior. You have one way ticket to heaven. Oh God. When you arrive to heaven, I know you want to talk to Abraham. Sour. But let me tell you, there is a kingdom to experience before you die. May, may that decree never declared over my life that I will see and not enter. So Moses is told, go back to the mountain and die. So Moses, I'm sorry. Let's appreciate our pastor. Now, Caleb is here. He's still with Joshua. 
They are the ones that entered. Now let me tell you. Seeing is not enough. You must enter. And let me tell you, servants of God, we must explain the truth of the kingdom so well so that the believer will enter. Thank you so, so much. Now, can you give me 10 minutes on this point? Now, Kabura Kataba. Go back to John chapter 3. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the new birth experience is determined from heaven. The entering is determined by the water and the spirit. Please, tell your neighbor you'll understand. We, we, are, we, we are not complicated. May, may, may you catch a spirit of understanding. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Tell your neighbor, you must be born of water and spirit to enter. Because somebody may ask, okay, pastor, nimekuelewa, nimeshika. I can see, but I, I'm not entering. So, what do I do to enter? It is the water and spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who created? Now, don't be afraid. I'm, <laughs> it's not a difficult question. It's obvious. Who created heaven and earth? Go to the next verse. The earth was without form. Wait a minute. God created heavens and earth. But the Bible says the earth was without form. Now, I want to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, because this is another theme altogether. God created the earth without form for a purpose. Now, we'll come to where you are. Hey. We are coming. God created heaven in perfection, but he created the earth with imperfection. So the perfection in heaven can become eventually the perfection of the earth. That's why Jesus prayed and said when you pray, how do you pray? Let your will, the perfection in heaven be done on the earth to perfect the earth. The earth that God created was without form. That is why, man of God, we can have believers who don't have form, but they have been created in God. You look at their lives, there is no form. But let me tell you, they are the creation of God. They have been born from above, but yet they don't have form. That is why you can find believers even in your team. They are not here today. They are not here today. You can have believers who are empty. But their emptiness does not mean they have not been created by God. They have been birthed. But there is another birthing that needs to take. They don't have form. They are shapeless. Even when they come to give a testimony, they say, God is good all the time. All the time. God is. Have you noticed that statement is always being elongated? I don't even think I'm happy. It was God is good. And then now it became God is good all the time. And then now all the time God is good. And that is his nature. Wow. I don't know the next one will come. You know why? They don't have words to say. They are empty. They don't have form. But they are born from above. When you look at their life, there is full of darkness. But don't be deceived.
deceived. God is not through with them. The earth had those three things. Number one, no form. Tell your neighbor, no form. Number two, void or empty. Number three, darkness. So how can this believer be used by God? God has to bath them again. And this is a good news that was happening there. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Unless you are born of spirit and water. You cannot enter. So the same act of creation in Genesis chapter 1 is the same thing that God does to a believer. So this is you. You are like the earth. Empty. Formless. Dark. But God says as long as you are covered by water the spirit will come upon you. And when the spirit comes upon the water then that earth that was without form will begin to take form. Am I making sense? So why is it that we 